Hello, and welcome to New Beginnings Baptist Church. We are so glad that you've chose to join us today for this time of worship. My name is Pastor Brian, and our goal here is to help you to know and love God more. We believe that God has something special planned for you during this time. So let's hear from God's Word now. Uh, today marks the beginning of a new series for our messages. Uh, we'll be going through these for about four or five weeks. We're studying the book of Galatians. So in your Bibles, you should be able to find it. If you don't know where Galatians is, start with the index at the very beginning of the Bible. It will tell you what page Galatians on is it on in your Bible. And so then you can turn there. Mine is uh, 1047. So if that helps you, I don't know. But in my Bible, it's on page 1047. As we prepare to dive into this letter to a first century church, we might as well, we might, it might be helpful if your pastor can get his words together. It might be helpful for us to actually consider some of the background about why this letter was written to the church. Paul, let's start with that. Paul is the author of Galatians. How do we know? Starting in verse 1, Paul. I don't think we can get any clearer than that. He says, as an apostle, and then he continues on. He is, that's the way they identified who was writing the letter. They would start it off. I'm the author of this letter. Paul is saying, I'm the author of this letter. He is the human author. Those of us who have studied the Bible, we know that all Scripture is inspired by God. So God is ultimately the author, but Paul is the human instrument of writing. So he is the human author. He is a church planting missionary. When he got saved, when he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord, he kind of learned quickly and was sent out to go start churches all throughout the world, really. He is well known for taking several missionary trips where he planted and started new churches. And this is one of the churches that he started, is in Galatia. Galatians is written to the people of Galatia. And so he wrote this, and he, after he started a church, he would spend a while there getting the leadership built up, kind of establishing the, the routine of what a church is and what they should do. And once he left, once he felt comfortable with uh, the leaders that he left in place, he would go on to start another church, but he would continue to write back to the churches that he cared about. And here he writes back to the Galatians. Galatians is such a letter. And so why don't we, now that we have a little bit of background, I could go into a lot more detail. I could talk to you about the dynamics of Galatia, the population of it, the location of it. I could talk about all that, but we're not here for a history lesson. We're here to hear from God's Word, so let's do just that. Galatians chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse 1 and continue down to about verse 12. So join me in whatever way you can to read God's word, starting in verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And to all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace to you from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. According to the will of God our Father, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am amazed that you were so quickly turning away from him who called you by great, the grace of Jesus Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but that there are some who are troubling you 
and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or another angel from heaven should preach to you any gospel contrary to what we have already preached to you, a curse be on him. As we've said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, cursed be him. For I am now trying to persuade, uh, for am I now trying to persuade people or God? Am I striving to please people? If I were striving to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we can study it. Please speak to our hearts and our minds. Reveal yourself to us through this message so that we can glorify you more, so we can respond to you better, and we can share you with others who need to hear the truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I find it interesting that Paul starts off, and he identifies himself and everything, but he kind of lays this out as a, uh, he starts off, and to me it kind of raises two different questions. As I started reading this, it basically got down to some questions that, I'm, I'm often asked, or students that I know of have been asked, or other believers that I, I'm helping walk through life are asked by others. And these are some common questions for a church that we really should know the answers to. For, like, what makes us a church? What really makes us a church? The Church of Galatia was called a church but it seems like they lost their identity. They lost what made them a church. They got confused about things. They were, they were uh, mixed up with some of the other teachings, some of the other people of influence that had come into the church, and they lost what it means to be a church of Jesus Christ, a church that honors God. And so what is a church? What are the key foundational things? What are... what? What are our functions? Even more so, what does it mean to be a Christian? What is a Christian? What does it take to be a Christian? If you go ask the common person on the street, it's to be good and to be born in America, really. Because you were born in America, you're automatically a Christian. One of, uh, I, I love this, one of my... Uh, one of my mentor's mentors, so it's a, a now third generation, he would always say this, well, if you were born in an oven, would you be a biscuit? <laughs> I've seen it this way. If you, were, if, if you are in a garage, does that mean you're a car? Just because of your location, it doesn't define what you are. And so when we ask the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? It's more than being in the United States. It's more than being in a church, more than growing up in a church. There's more to it, but what? See, these are the kinds of questions that challenge believers today. That really challenge us to be able to identify what it means to follow Christ. And what's scary is that, especially dealing with students... They get into their first year of college, and one of the mandatory classes as a freshman is intro into philosophy. You know what the first question of philosophy is? Is there God? That's the first unit of every intro to philosophy class. And so when the professor, a well-respected, well-educated person, gets out there and asks, are you a Christian, which is often asked, anyone who says yes is often blasted because they don't know the real answers. Well, I grew up in church. Well, I went to this big church. Well, I was in Sunday school all the time. I went to vacation Bible school every summer. Well, I did this and I did that and that makes me a Christian. 
No, that doesn't. And how does that prove God, the existence of God? How do you know the Bible is real? I can go on with these questions. These are questions that are, are leading to abandonment of Christianity for many people. Because they have not been taught the foundational thing that makes them a Christian, that makes us a church. That's why churches are closing at phenomenal rates right now. Because they've lost their identity. There's a, a major movement called the uh, deconstruction movement. There are so many people that are saying, I have deconstructed my faith. And, and they're proud of this. And they walk you through the process. Basically, they challenge everything that we know to be absolutely true. And they say, well, that's not for sure. So I'm going to move it out of what I actually believe. You know, and this is really not something new. Do you know Thomas Jefferson, great president, great great uh, ambassador for the United States. You know what he did? He, he wrote his own Bible, basically. What he took out of the New Testament was every miracle that ever happened. And it's called the Jefferson New Testament. So he just talked about the moral teachings of Jesus and took out anything that was supernatural. That's basically what deconstructionists are doing. They're taking out everything that cannot be explained completely and removing it. But let me make this more personal for you today, because probably not too many of you are taking an intro to philosophy class. Not too many people are, are, are going through this deconstructionist movement. But let me ask it more personally. How does a vibrant Christian... Once, when they got saved, they were, they were on fire, is what it's called. On fire for God. How do they become lifeless and apathetic? How do they come, become complacent and just be okay with Sunday morning service for an hour and that's good enough for my spiritual life now? Better yet, how does a vibrant church, a church that started off strong, a church that was planted and, and began reaching people, how does it become irrelevant in its own community? See, unprepared Christians get ambushed by these thoughts, get ambushed by these questions. And I bring them up because we need to be prepared to answer. We need to be prepared to talk about these things. We need to be ready because many times under the pressure of these questions, the Christian life crumbles and fades and, and it really knocks us down and knocks us out. I know. Pastor, you're coming up kind of strong. You're supposed to be an encourager, Pastor. Well, all I'm doing is going back to what Paul talks about here. See, Again, a little bit of background. In the first century, when this was written, the tradition was you started off any letter with a thanksgiving. You started off by saying something good about who you're writing to. You know, in parenting, the new concept is uh, you, you give them a sandwich of compliments. You give them something good to think about, you talk about the negative, and then you finish with something good to think about. That's kind of the structure of how you're supposed to deal with children nowadays. My dad never gave me the top layer or the bottom layer. No, he, he did. But the main point was you got a whole lot of the middle. If you did something wrong, I'm not going to tell you how good of a kid you are or how great and proud I am of you. I'm going to talk about what you did wrong. Now, of course, I was the good kid, so I didn't get too many of those lectures. But my other siblings, you know, they had to endure that. And so I heard through the door as, you know, secondhand. <laughs> You're laughing at me like you don't believe me. <laughs> Paul 
Paul takes this the same tone with Galatia, though. He's like, listen, I don't have time for niceties. I don't have time to deal with, with you know, the things I'm proud of you for or, or the things I, you know, you're doing right. I have time to deal with the main issue. I'm going to talk about that from the very beginning because I don't know how much time you're going to pay attention. I don't know how much time we have. I really don't know what's going to happen next. But what I know is we've got to get this settled. I'm reminded of a, a, a movie speech. One of my favorite movies of all time is Remembering the Titans. Yes, it's a sports movie. I get that. But really, it was dealing with something bigger. It was dealing with race issues. It was dealing with diversity and, and the problems of getting people to work together. And there's part of a speech in there that the coach gives. And he says, Men, he's standing at Gettysburg. Just at the break of dawn, the, the morning mist, the morning fog is still rolling off the, the land. And he's saying, men died here on this field. Fighting the same fight that we're still fighting today. Listen. Take a lesson from the dead, he says. If we don't come together right now on this hollowed ground, we too will be destroyed just like they were. And I can't help but think, churches today, we're on the same battleground. And if we don't settle some things right away, we're going to suffer some of the same things we see throughout all of history. And so, Paul takes this tone, and it's basically like a parent when they see their kid getting ready to run out in the middle of the street. Do you sit there and address them and say, now, cute little child, we really don't want to run out in the street and explain to them all of why you don't, or do you give them an option? Now, you can run out in the street and get hit by a car, or you can ha come have a candy. No, when a kid is running out in the street, what do you do? Stop! Well, why are you yelling at that kid? Because their life is in danger. Paul is taking the same tone. He's, he's basically saying, listen, church, this is an issue. I would love to spend time and tell you all the great things you're doing, and you should really focus on those positive issues. Man, you're, you're, you're just doing some things right, but you're getting this one thing wrong. Paul's like, no, you're getting the one thing wrong. And I, I'm kind of amazed here that he, he starts off and he, and he brings attention to the issue. Look at verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present age, according to the will of our God and Father, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You know what that is? What those, th those three verses are? That's the gospel. That's the gospel message. That is the, the thing we have to get right. And Paul is drawing attention to this right away. Another verse that, that kind of shows Paul's focus on the gospel is in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, it says, I pass on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and they rose again on the third day according to the scripture. If there's one thing that we have to get right, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. A lot of other things, man, I, I know there are a lot of other things that churches really focus on. That Christians really focus on. 
that preachers really focus on. But the one thing that we have to absolutely get right is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we don't get this right, we are wasting our time. There is nothing left for us to do. The gospel is the only thing that matters. Paul says, I am amazed. And it's not like I'm amazed, you know, like when we are talking to our grandkids or our kids and says, wow, that drawing that you did in kindergarten, I'm so amazed at your skills. Paul's not talking about how amazed he is that they can color a piece of paper. Or the, the crap projects that kids do during, you know, kindergarten and first grade, second grade. Heck, some people I know that do crap projects in middle school. Their middle school projects are not that great. But their parents will always say, isn't it so amazing? I'm amazed by what they do. That's not what Paul is saying here. That's the wrong tone. Paul is saying, I'm amazed. I'm, a, I'm astonished. I'm appalled. I'm shocked. I'm dumbfounded. I'm overwhelmed by the thought that you are getting this wrong. I'm, I'm alarmed at the fact that you are listening to other people bring other gospel into this. So when he says, I'm amazed, it's not... Not a positive thing, like we would often say. This is, um, are you kidding me type of moment? Paul is saying, I'm amazed. Why such a crazy beginning to this story, or to the letter at Galatia? Because of the gravity of the problem. Because of the seriousness of the problem. Because of what's going on. Now, what's going on was that we read in verse 6. He says, I'm amazed that you so quickly turn from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So there are false teachers that have come into the church. And they've started teaching that there is something else besides Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that we need to have right. There's something else we need to focus on. That's good, but we need to add to it. And Paul is saying, no, that's another gospel. You are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. That's it. There is nothing else that can save us. And Paul is getting this and he's saying, he's not shocked by false teachers. See, false teachers have always been around. And they will always be around. I'm amazed at some of the people that call themselves Christians and they listen to some of the teachings that are out there that teach anything but Jesus. That teach anything in addition to Jesus. They just, it, it, I'm kind of like Paul and kind of amazed that that would even happen. How can you call yourself a Christian and get this one fact wrong? It is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that is the most important thing to us? And why does Paul make it a big issue? Why is he, why is he spending so much time seeing her saying, I'm amazed that you so quickly turned away from this because of the, well, they were turning away from the gospel. And turning away from the gospel, the first fill in the blank there is, it's serious. It is a serious issue. This is something we can't handle lightly to make sure we don't hurt people's feelings. This is not something that we do just to, oh, you know, we'll kind of, we'll do the gospel a little bit over here, but we'll really do more. You know, let's do self-help. That's really good for our society. Let's do feel-good messages. That's good. No, the gospel, it's so serious. See, basically, Paul equates what they were doing to trading sides. Changing teams. Changing alliance. You know, it's kind of like... If you're a Cowboys fan, 
You cannot root for any other team. It's against the rules. Cowboys fans are the worst. It's the Cowboys or nobody. Well, I say the worst just because I like to pick on Cowboys fans. But really, it's with any sports team. With any team that you are a fan of, it's your team or no one else. I've heard it said this way, if you're really a fan of something, you are, uh, you are a fan of that team and any other team that's playing your rival. That's it. But let me think about it, because I know sports are not everyone's thing. It's more like to take about the seriousness, because really, I mean, people nowadays change their fandom all the time. They change which teams they're rooting for, like, you know, like you're going to the supermarket. You can just pick a new one this week and try it. But it, really, the more seriousness of this issue is it's like betraying your country. See, betraying the gospel or turning your back on the gospel, listening to anything but the gospel, is like becoming a, a, a betrayer. A, you turn your back on the country, you are, you are just, you are basically committing espionage. You are a, a double agent. You are a spy. You are, I can't, I can't find the words to say how, how vital this is, how serious of an issue this is. If we don't focus on the gospel, if the gospel is not everything that we do, then it becomes another gospel. When someone turns away from Christ, it should grieve us. We should be on our knees. We should be heartbroken over the fact that they, are, they have lost the truth. Paul is that way. And it's saying basically there is nothing more important than the loyalty to this gospel. Paul is shocked and amazed by them turning away so quickly. It happened so quickly. Paul planted this church in Galatia and he sets up the leadership and he sets up the foundations. He starts going through them. Uh, some discipleship classes, some basic Christian classes. And he goes through all this with them. And then he goes off to start another church. He's like, you got this. You're good. You're good. And then all of a sudden he hears back that they have abandoned the very thing that he taught them. And it happens quickly. I don't know the time frame in between here, but let's, let's, let's think about this. If Paul started the church and let's say three years later, they abandon it. That would be too quick. Let's say 10 years down the road, they abandon it. It would be too quick. 15, 20, 30, 40, 50. If in this lifetime, you abandon the one true gospel that, that you have come to believe as a Christian, then it was too quick. Jesus compares it to the seed that enters into the ground, sprouts up quickly, and then it gets burnt off by the weather. It happens too quick. And so Paul heard that they were now accepting another gospel. Basically, it was Jesus plus. Jesus plus anything is not the gospel. Jesus plus nothing, that's the gospel. Because there's nothing that you can do, nothing that you can say, nothing that we can contribute to. Salvation is by the grace of Jesus Christ alone. There is nothing that we do to contribute to, to add to our salvation. It was done by Jesus on the cross. And so he was amazed by this and his frustration continues throughout the letter. I love, as, you, as we'll continue to study, Galatians chapter 3, he starts off that chapter with something that I, I, 
I just have to highlight here. He starts off, you foolish Galatians. Because if we abandon Jesus, if we abandon the gospel, if we forget that the gospel is what makes us a church, if we say that the if we say anything else but the gospel makes us a Christian, then basically we're fools. You foolish Galatians. He barely returns. He barely leaves them and they have turned to false teachings. But it was not hopeless. It was not hopeless. There was still time, as Hebrews 3, 1 says, as long as it's still called today, there is time. As long as you are hearing these words, there is time for you to fix this issue. There's time for us to deal with what's most important. If we have forgotten the gospel, if we've abandoned the gospel in any part of our life, if our marriage is not based on the gospel, if our family is not based on the gospel, if our finances are not based on the gospel, if our friendships are not based on the gospel, if our church is not based on the gospel, there's time to fix it today. See, I'm amazed by this. That Jesus, God of the universe, Savior of whoever believes, comes and we deal with things like this. We struggle with things like this. And Jesus says, you know what? As long as you come back, it's okay. But don't waste any time. I heard this said, the basic measure of mature Christian is this. How quickly do you repent? How quickly after Jesus exposes a sin in your life, do you get on your knees and beg him to forgive you? And plead with him to say, and, and, uh, and just come to him and say, I am broken and I need your salvation again today. Now his salvation was complete on the cross. He doesn't have to do anything else for our salvation. But scripture reminds us of salvation is a process. It's, a, it's an ongoing thing. We are continually being saved. And so all this happens, but I, we need to realize what we are doing when we turn from the gospel. When we turn from the gospel, we are turning from God himself. I'm amazed that you so quickly turned away from him, Jesus Christ, who called you by the grace of Christ. We turn away from God. See, Christianity is not a religious system but it's knowing God himself. And if we accept anything but the gospel, we're turning away from God. We're abandoning God. We're leaving God. When we turn from the gospel, it's no small thing. Do you realize there is no such thing thing as a, a, a just a small error especially when talking about our faith but in many other things you know I think about in carpentry you make a small error at the very beginning and what happens by the end of a cut that small error is now huge that's why I was always taught the saying a measure twice cut once but I never, never really got that because I always still have to, you know, cut about four or five times when I'm trying to, you know, and with the price of wood nowadays, you can't make too many errors. Otherwise, it's really going to cost you. But I think about one, a, a, a significant error in the 1986 World Series. Baseball, for those of you who don't know. It's a small little thing that happens Bill Buckner was getting ready to handle a ground ball. You know what those are. That means the ball is just rolling on the ground. Now, I didn't play baseball for very long, but they always taught me how to handle a ground ball. That's actually like one of the first things you have to learn how to do. 
Before you learned how to catch in the air or, or be able to, to throw to base and get it out, you have to learn how to catch a ball on the ground. And so they tell you, get your feet wide, get your glove, wherever your glove is, put it on the ground and make sure the ball lines up right with the glove. So make sure the ball is coming towards you and don't try to get anywhere else. Bill Buckner, a professional baseball player in the World Series, makes an error. He lets a ground ball go between his legs. May not seem like a very big deal, right? They end up losing that game and eventually lose the entire World Series because of that error. Everyone tells you it goes back to Bill Buckner's mistake. If we don't get the gospel right, we are turning from God and it's no small thing. It's no small mistake. But when we turn from the gospel, we are also turning from grace. I love that. Verse 6 says, by grace. Grace is one thing that sets Christianity apart. Grace means that it's unmerited. It's undeserved. We don't do anything to get this. It is a free gift. You know, I love my coffee. And I go get coffee quite a bit. And I love the places that, that reward you for getting coffee. They give you a free coffee. I like that. I like getting free coffee. But you know that free coffee really isn't free. It's after 10 purchases, you get another one for free. And they never give you the side. <laughs> like, yeah. So, but grace is not that kind of free. It is absolutely free. See, with our salvation, there is nothing you can do to earn God's love. Which also means there is nothing you can do to lose God's love. That's grace. Grace stands us out from everything else. You know, the work faith religions are rampant nowadays. They're so popular because you're earning something to, to get what you're wanting. And in our society, that's a huge deal. Well, nothing's for free. I got to do something for it. I got to earn my way. That's why so many false religions out there are becoming very popular because people feel good about doing something to earn that status. There is nothing we can do to earn God's love. It's grace. Trusting in Christ alone means salvation is here. But turning from grace, turning from faith... Gets us. I got, I got a little practice for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you letters to write down on your paper. So find a place on your paper. Write these letters down. N-O-W-H-E-R-E. -E. Now, did you write nowhere? Or did you write now here? See, if we are earning God's love, if we're trying to earn God's favor, we get nowhere. But if we trust in Christ, grace is now here. It depends on where you put that break, where you put the focus. We as a church, we've got to get this right. Our focus needs to be on grace alone. But we are turning, and that's where the next thing is, when we turn from the gospel, we turn to nothing. I love what he says here, and they are turning to a different gospel, not that there, there is another gospel. Paul's sarcasm is so great. I think we miss it because it's just in writing in front of us. 
But like when you actually hear the, the tone that he's taking, not that there is any other gospel. There is no other gospel. But they're turning from the gospel to accept something else. So we'll call it the gospel because that's what they're calling it. But there is no such thing as another gospel. It's Jesus on the cross, in the grave, alive again, that gets us saved. That's the gospel message. I, do you get that yet? Have you heard the gospel yet? Because that's it. If you don't hear that, you hear nothing. You turn to nothing. Paul makes it clear there's nothing else besides this. It's this or nothing. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Salvation through faith and grace alone. Or it's nothing. If we're not about the gospel, Paul is basically saying we might as well close up shop. Just, just board it all up. We'll give it to somebody else. Because if we don't get this right... He takes this so seriously that again he says in verse 8 and 9, he says, If we were to preach to you anything else except the gospel, may we be cursed. And he, he, he doesn't exclude himself. He says, if I preach to you anything else, if I tell you anything else that is contrary to the gospel, a curse be on me. As a church, we need to hear this. If we start getting focused on anything else but the gospel, as a church, we might as well be cursed. Can you think of churches that you know of that it seems like they're cursed somehow? wonder if it's because they forgot the gospel. Do you ever feel like sometimes your life may be cursed? Wonder if it's because we forgot the gospel. Let me show you what's at stake to finish up this. Let me show you what's at stake here. I see three things at stake from this passage as we read, as we studied it. I see three things at stake here. And if we turn from the gospel, if we don't start sharing the gospel, if we're not all about the gospel, here's what's at stake. The glory of Christ. Christ's glory is at stake. Not saying that God's going to lose any significance in the, the grand scheme of things. But in our own lives, we will not glorify Christ. In our own church, we will not be Christ honoring. If we don't preach the gospel, if we don't teach the gospel, if we don't live the gospel, if the gospel is not in everything that we do, the glory of God is not in us, on us, around us. We're nowhere. We're nothing without the gospel. The glory of Christ is not around us. Well, I like the way other churches and other religions and other faith make me feel. Well, that's great. Those things can make you feel good about yourself. But they do not save you. They don't save us. Just because I feel good doesn't mean I'm I'm, I'm really good. I like eating chocolate. It makes me feel good. If I eat chocolate all the time, what's going to happen? Besides me getting fat. Thank you very much for that obvious thing. I'm not healthy. I'm, not, I'm going to die if all I eat is chocolate. If we have anything but the gospel... We're going to die. Second thing at, at stake here is if we don't preach the gospel, people's souls are at risk. People's souls are on the line. You're thinking like, Pastor, you're really over-exaggerating this issue. I know preachers are good about exaggerating things. I mean, listen to any report about a church. They're exaggerated. Just like any fisherman. Well, you should have seen this fish I caught. Mm -hmm. 
They exaggerate things. Well, pastor, you're exaggerating this. No, actually on this one, I'm not. This is not an exaggeration. If we don't get the gospel right, if we're not about the gospel, people's souls really were at risk. And Paul took this seriously. Romans chapter 9 is one of my one of the most significant verses to help me stay focused on the gospel. Paul, the apostle Paul, the great preacher and teacher of the New Testament said this. He said, "I wish that I could be cursed and caught off from God if I knew that someone else could be saved." If someone else would get saved, I would take on the curse of going to hell in their, pl in their place. Because that's exactly what Christ did for us. So as Christians, we need to be willing to take that same risk for someone else. People's souls are at risk. There are so many people dying and, and lost and suffering on this earth that Paul was willing to do anything to see someone come, become saved. To, to share the gospel with anyone and everyone. So let me ask you, what are you willing to do for the gospel? What are we as a church willing to do for a gospel? What am I willing to do for the gospel? Am I willing to give up some of my freedoms to share the gospel with somebody? Are you? If it comes a time where you have to either declare Christ as God or deny Him, what would you do? What if you were threatened with jail time? What if we were over in China where just having a prayer meeting in your home will get you a life sentence? <coughs> Are you willing to give up freedoms for the gospel? Are you willing to give up your health? Would you put your health at risk to share the gospel with somebody? What about your finances or your time? What is it, someone's soul, what is, what is it worth to you? Oh, I'm not asking you an intellectual question. I really want to see what you do for someone else's soul. Paul was willing to give up anything. The last thing that's at risk is our church health. Paul writes to Galatia and he says, if you don't get this right, you're not a church. Your church is not healthy. Your church is not good. Paul knew that if they missed the gospel, they missed everything. Oh, their music could be good. Their their worship team could be great. I mean, they could have a nice facility. They could have their social media all in order and be online and active. But if they miss the gospel, they're not really a church. Churches get bogged down with so many non-essential things that they forget the most important thing. Paul was willing to put his life on the line for the gospel and for the church. He was willing to die for it. You know, the saying is, pick the hill that you're willing to die on. This is the hill I'm willing to die on. I risk everything to stand on this gospel alone. What's in here is worth everything. If I don't get this right, it's worth nothing to me. So, if your goal in life is to be liked, to get along well with others, to have a nice, easygoing life, don't be a Christian. Don't follow Christ. Honestly, I would tell you this. Don't come to our church if you want the easygoing life. Because God's going to ask us to put things on the line that are going to make us uncomfortable. God's going to put things, ask us to, to risk things 
to really show us the value of what it's worth. If following Jesus and sharing the gospel is your goal in life, then be ready to do something great. Beyond your imagination. Because I'll tell you what, there is nothing like that moment when someone accepts Christ. If you have been around somebody when that moment happens, heaven opens up. Amen. You get a glimpse of God himself but you know what's, what's at risk? If you start bringing up the gospel, your relationship with them might be at risk. Your job might be at risk. Your freedoms, your finances, everything else we've gone through might be at risk to share the gospel. But I'd put all of it online to get a glimpse of God saving someone's soul again. So, Paul takes it seriously. I'm asking you, how serious to you is the gospel? I think I've, I've laid it out there pretty clearly. It's either the gospel or nothing to me. That's where I stand. Now where do you? Thank you for joining us for worship today. I hope and pray that God has challenged or inspired you through this message. And if he has, please leave a comment or send us an email and let us know. Also, you could do those same things to let us know if there's any prayer requests you have that we could join you in prayer for. Thank you again for watching. Hope to see you again soon. God bless you.